once I will record. So Dean, yeah, we're, this is our team building for uh, bringing empathy to politicians, bring them to, so we just hit the record button. We're doing introductions. Dean, do you wanna? Hi, yeah. Um, my interest in the empathy circle process is the fact that it, it has a spiral nature and what may start off as a very shallow conversation by the end of the process actually ends up in very deep and meaningful conversations. And if we can get um, our political elites to actually invest in this process, maybe they will give up the shouting at each other from across the chamber and this polarization that is then pandemic throughout our culture and we can actually start building a new culture. Great, thanks, uh, Sarah. Yeah. Um... I've noticed polarization, not just politically, but also in the environmental um, organization I'm with and as well as the holistic community. And I just uh, want to concur with Eric that QAnon has been a tremendous influence. In fact, the, uh, one of the other empathy circles, someone shared with me that there was a hijacking of the holistic community you and they actually um, using uh, like yoga music and trance things and and going down a rabbit hole because people who I've known have switched political ideologies and it doesn't make any sense. There's no rational thought, um, but they've addressed Q, and I'm concerned about unsubstantiated un concerns. Um, I'm just concerned and I'm concerned about and there is no empathy because when someone makes up their mind they've stayed there in that position and it's kind of this mind trance so there's no ability to see another viewpoint um, I've noticed for the people who have subscribed to Q who are among my friends okay well thanks for that I don't know what QAnon is but just to be clear that we're really focusing here very specifically, the scope is going to be how do we get Congress members together into empathy circles or MPs? I guess what you call them in the UK, right? Mm -hmm. MPs, ministers of parliament. Yeah. 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 Just, I just want to say that it's, uh, it's a very influential group and it, it is actually part of how people now think in Congress. You can track it back to what those idealistic groups actually built up. So, okay. Okay. But, I, but it's clear for me that this is about the congressional, yeah, for yeah. sure. Great, so what I thought I would do is just show a slideshow. I just whipped this together, it's very rough, but my way is usually throw something out there and keep iterating on it. So <laughs> this would be sort of the first uh, test here of this slideshow and I'll just keep, uh, you know, we can keep iterating on it. So I will share it here. Um, on the screen. So is that coming up? Empathy goes to Congress. Mm -hmm. We got yeah. that. Okay. So this is, uh, you know, our, our Congress, Washington, D.C. I'm imagining putting our empathy tent kind of on that lawn eventually. <laughs> we have an empathy tent, which you'll see it a little bit further. So we're starting off with uh, you know, with our first empathy circle in January, this is Mark, uh, Congressman Mark DeSalnier. And we've been, we've reached out to him a bunch of times. We actually, uh, Lou, who's one of the trainers for the empathy circle facilitation training, uh, he and I went and actually talked to Mark at a, you know, 30 minute, you know, talk in his office, you know, before COVID, we gave him an empathy t-shirt and, you know, he committed to doing an empathy circle, but it's been like pulling teeth to actually get him to sit down and do it. But I think now with uh, COVID, you know, he, he wanted to do it in person. And now with COVID, we're doing everything online. So it should be a lot easier. Oops. Oh, there we go. So we had previous meetings with Mark. And let me see if this actually works. Just a little video. You'll see the empathy tent there. This was like a couple of years ago. We had our empathy tent set up at a, at a, town hall outside of a town hall is a bit of an expo. And let me just see if this works. And oops, gotta trim the, oh, stop, stop, stop. No, it's, 
the uh, whoops. Sorry, this is uh, problem is here. This thing is. I have to turn the audio. There we go. Oh, hmm. I have to. That is. Oh, I have to turn this on. You might have to stop sharing and then reshare and click the little. Yeah. You could also try uh, type by clicking the YouTube, uh, then it will be directly in your browser. But, yeah. yeah, the thing it, it, it's got this. Oh, it's annoying. It's how we learn. Yeah, it's the uh, the audio. It, it's turned off the audio. So. If you try to open it directly in the browser, probably you will hear the sound and then you come back to the slideshow okay. after. There we go. I think I got it. Okay. Well, yeah, share screen. Are we back? So you're seeing. Oops. The tent where it is a resistance uh, fair put on by Mark de Saulnier in Pleasant Hill. There's a lot of different events going on, not events, but a lot of different uh, booths and uh, people giving uh, uh, different organizations having a presence and talking to people. And Mark de Saulnier and some of the people from Indivisible just gave a talk. So we set up Empathy Tent and we have a whole team here. We're doing listening, we're talking about the work that we do. Kind of advocating for a culture of empathy and just talking to a wide variety of, of uh, people and making a lot of contacts. Uh, I think a couple of the groups said they wanted to invite me to come and talk to their group about empathy and I said yeah we can do some empathy circle training. So it's been really good for making connections and uh, had a pretty good uh, turnout here so um, I'm very pleased with what's, uh, what we've been doing and, and the connections and the effectiveness of what we're, what we're doing. So uh, that's it. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so sharing that full screen does not work very well. So, oh, cool. I thought it was just at my end. Yeah, it it's, was. The audio was not, not good. The audio wasn't good. Okay, let's see. So let me try sharing this again. This time I'll do a little bit, won't do it full screen. Okay, well, that's one thing for testing. So that was uh, one of the calls. The other one was, uh, I, I've met, I've talked to our congressman maybe four times, you know, on this topic. And it and then there was a, uh, a town hall with uh, Barbara Lee. I don't know if you know Barbara Lee. She's one of the most liberal Congress members. Uh, she's from Oakland, California. And she had, they had a, uh, with Mark DeSalnier, they had a town hall uh, talking about race. And I put in, a, well, let me just show you, show, you, show you that. So hopefully this is gonna work. I'm Edwin Rutsch, director of the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy, and I'm thrilled that uh, Congressman Marc Desaunier and Congresswoman Barbara Lee have agreed to take part in an empathy circle on the topic of racism with uh, Republican representatives. And I wanted to give a little bit of an overview how that came about. Our center hosts regular empathy circles for bridging personal and social and political divides. And an empathy circle is simply a, a very effective structured dialogue process for supporting meaningful and constructive dialogue. And it increases mutual understanding and connection by ensuring that each person feels uh, heard to their satisfaction. On Saturday, April 27th, I attended a town hall organized by the two representatives uh, entitled a Conversation on Race. During the Q&A, the very last question posed was the one I submitted in which I asked the representatives if they would take part in an empathy circle. Uh, it, the uh, discussion and comments went as follows. 
I want to thank the panel. The final question is actually to our two representatives, and if they want to make a summation comment, you can do so at this time. Um, is there a place, or would the representative be willing to take part in an empathy circle with Republican representatives on the topic of racism? <laughs> Sure. sure. <laughs> I'm a member of Congress. I'm a masochist. Yes, I would. <laughs> Brilliant, informative. Uh, thank you all so much. And I want to thank all of you because these, these are tough times, tough conversations, uh, but you're here. And I hope that a um, couple of things that we get out of this is that when you go home in your neighborhoods, you know, to talk to people, have these conversations, the tough conversations. I know Mark and myself, we're willing to be part of that. Uh, thank you all. I'm Edwin Rutsch, director of the Center for... Oh, there we go. Okay, so, yeah. Uh, Hi, Mark. Talking about conversations and empathy, uh, you know, we had talked about doing some empathy circles with uh, Republicans. So I was wanting to kind of follow up on that. So after the election, would you be willing to do an empathy circle with uh, some Republicans to talk about bridging the divides? And I'm getting better at asking these questions. So one, by what date could we do that? And two, would you, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> by what date could we do that kind of specifically? And would you and your staff actively uh, help, you know, kind of set that up? And I did want to give a quick quote from Joe Biden uh, you know, while he's running for office. He says, empathy matters, compassion matters. We have to reach out to one another to heal this country. And that's what I'll do as president. So I thought here's a way that we could do that here in our, in our own uh, county, so. Yeah, um, it's hard because, um, I, I mean, I work with Republicans, but they are, I, I, I have a Republican colleague uh, who is a friend with, who's now part of the administration. Um, I'll give you a hint, he's from Texas and he deals with intelligence. Um, but I, I, you know, I tried to get, uh, do some things, even though he's very conservative, um, together, I tried to get him to come out to the Bay Area just to have a conversation um, at Berkeley. And he just said, I can't because I will get hit with I took a trip to the, to the University of California at Berkeley just to have a conversation about conservatives from Texas and liberals from the Bay Area. So well, I, I, that's not to equivocate. I'll do it. I'm, mm -hmm. By the way, I, I just finished a section of the book um, Behave. If any of you have read that, it's a 700 page um, tome to why why we act the way we do from the amygdala to the frontal cortex to the hippocampus and, canvas, and um, as the section I just finished at about 600 pages uh, is about empathy and what the research talks about empathy and compassion um, and it's a it's the research isn't as, as good as it is a, is when it comes to the neuroscience how the brain functions um, but I think it's important to show people as human beings um, and you can be different, um, but that part of empathy is important. So um, Chanel, we can do it. It's gotta be, as far as COVID, uh, we just gotta do it around the best Online. practice of public health, which may be easier actually. So we'll yeah. work with it and um, let's try to do it let's, uh, in the next, before the end of January. That's a realistic, and I'm only saying that because that's knowing my calendar, that's realistic. <laughs> if I'm lucky enough to be my Republican phone. Okay, so that I hope you understood that. So that's the that's our Congressman. I was in a Zoom call with him with some political people. I kind of cut everybody else out, just him and his uh, manager. It's a district manager is, or uh, Chanel and uh, so, you know, he says he's willing to do it. You can just see it's a big process of getting him involved, making connections, following up, keep pushing him, and he finally committed. So on the plus side is that Joe Biden and the Democrats say they support empathy. So that was the quote, 
you know, Joe Biden has multiple quotes that says, you know, empathy matters, compassion matters. We have to reach out to one another to heal this country. And that's what I'll do as a president. So we do have, uh, you know, them giving lip service, at least to empathy. And this was at the uh, acceptance speech. So this was, uh, if you saw the video, this is Camilla Harris uh, at the acceptance speech. And they had big screens on there saying, you know, people have uh, chosen empathy. And there, there it is again, just from a different angle. Uh, so, you know, they're giving, you know, lip service. It was highly, you know, promoted there. And uh, so the plan is to build a more, oops, uh, build a, let's see, uh, build a more empathic culture and society. That's for this team. Build a team that works to hold empathy circles between Democrat and Republican uh, Congress members, and that's misspelled. Team members reach out to their Congress members or MPs, invite them to take part in an empathy circle. Team helps with organization, promotion, brainstorming, and publicity, and uh, building the team. You know, so here's some things we can do as team members. One is we want everyone to get familiar with taking part in an empathy circle because that's what we're trying to do is get the members to take part. Two is be able to facilitate uh, empathy circles, and three of the people here involved in the facilitation training. So, uh, you know, we'd like to get everybody in involved in, in that. And then also to become a trained people, we have a, to become a trainer of, of the process as, as well. So if somebody wants to come in. So that was it. Um, so yeah, so hi Liz, uh, a little on the late hi. side, but we just had a yeah. presentation. So you, you missed that, but there'll be a recording of it. You can also always, uh, see that. So do you want to just uh, say who you are and your interest in the in the project? Yeah, absolutely. Hi, everyone. And I apologize for being late. I actually just saw the email a minute ago and then saw that it was happening right now. So I figured that I'd jump on just to learn a little bit more about what you all are doing. Um, I myself uh, host circles through um, my organization, We Heal for All. And uh, this whole depolarizing our country and um, really using empathy to uh, bridge some of the divides going on is very resonant and present with me right now. So I'm, I'm glad to see that this conversation is taking place over here and eager to learn more about what you all are doing. Oh, great. Yeah, so I just showed the, uh, went through a slide deck just showing kind of the work that we've done and getting, you know, our Congress member uh, involved in this, which will happen by January, laid out about the team building. And now we want to go into uh, kind of a, maybe a shorter empathy circle, just so that everyone is familiar with the empathy circle process. You can give your feedback and your ideas, uh, you know, through the empathy circle. Uh, so in, in this process, you know, one person will speak, they'll select who they're going to speak to and uh, you get uh, five minutes, up to five minutes to share. So you'll wanna speak a little bit, uh, pause, uh, get a reflection from the listener, uh, and then you know, check, did you feel heard and understood? If, if uh, you did, you continue. If you didn't, you can say it again till you feel heard and understood to your satisfaction. Uh, once you feel fully heard or your time is up, you can say, I feel fully heard. Then it's the listener's turn to select someone to speak to. And uh, the process just continues for the time allotted. And Liz, you can check the video. We, this is being recorded. So uh, you'll be able to check the, the video uh, when it's posted to the Facebook group. So we can get started with the empathy circle part of this. Just so what comes up with you? What ideas do you have you know, about this project or about the slideshow or just whatever? And since I did a lot of talking, I'll be quiet and let someone else, and maybe someone to keep time, five minutes. I don't know, Dean, are you up for timekeeping or are you still with us? Yep, I can keep time. Okay. I could start. Um, who so are you speaking I to? Who, who are you speaking to? 
uh, to you. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> and, model and it. I guess, yeah. yeah, and I guess to everyone. Um, so I first want to check like, how are you with honesty and with being direct? Um, because I, I, I believe a lot in empathy, but I also believe in sometimes I just need to put things out the way they are for me and then gradually I'll nuance, put more nuance into it. Mm -hmm. So how are you with honesty? Okay, so what I hear is you're really wondering how I am or others are with honesty because you like to just put things out and then sort of develop them. Is that, did I hear that right? Yeah, it, yeah, it's, and it's uh, because I can stay with the, the presence that I have in the moment and to get clarity. Yeah. So you like to just be honest and stay present with, uh, with, uh, with yourself for for having developing clarity. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, and and to also to get out because clarity is not just something that happens in words. It's something you understand before the words, and having a full presence will allow me to express myself in the clearest possible way. I think. So you'd really like to be fully present so you can clearly, you know, express yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And Is it okay if, if you can yeah. yeah, you can say anything you'd like, and I'm just gonna reflect you until you feel heard to your satisfaction. When you don't have anything yeah. else to say, you can say I feel fully heard. And yeah. But I also asked you a question. So how are you with honesty? <laughs> yeah. So I will answer when it's my turn to speak. So ah, right okay. now, I'm only going to, we're using the empathy circle process, which is- Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, I'm learning. So, yeah. So, you, do you feel okay. fully heard? Yeah, I feel heard. Yeah, okay. for this part. Then, uh, I guess I'll speak to uh, Dean, since you're, just to model it. Are you? Just checking the audio. You, you hear me? Yep. I'm not quite hearing you. Your voice is a little soft. Hang on, I'll put my headphones back in. Let me reset the timer. I apologize, everyone. I took them out because it was going to be more comfortable, but alas, the microphone on this thing's not working well enough. There we go. All right, we'll start the clock. Okay, hopefully the audio is working. Uh, yeah, so uh, I wasn't quite clear on what Eric meant by honesty, you know, be as honest as you want or be as dis when it in the empathy circle when it's your turn to speak, you can say whatever you want. So you can be as deceive, deceivious, devious, or as honest as you want. It's your choice. It's really you're free to do what you want. And, and there's no, you won't be judged, you'll be heard to your satisfaction. So I'm hearing you say that um, honesty is something you can bring to the circle, but you're not going to be judged if you do, if you don't bring honesty and you're devious. Um, it's just the process that we 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 are um, undertaking. Yeah. So when I do like mediation between the political left and right, it's like say whatever you want. If there's no political correctness, it's like your time to say it how you want, and the person that's listening will hear you to your satisfaction. So it doesn't matter what side of the, the equation you come from, the left or the right, um, the whole idea of the process is to be heard to your satisfaction. And that's what we want to do with the, bring the political, with the Congress members is the, the idea is to do a call like this and there'd be two Republicans and two Democrats and then it'd be a facilitator and the topic will be how might we bridge the political uh, divide and it's just, it'll be two hours for them to just kind of share their ideas and for us to record it just like we're doing right now. So the, the whole idea is to bring these two sides together uh, in the process and to record it so that others can see it. Yeah, and then scale up that uh, once we have uh, the, the one in the can modeled, then and then we put it out there publicly, then we can show that to other Congress members and hopefully that'll get them familiar with the process and you get, we can sort of expand and get, bring more uh, members in. So once we've got the proof of concept in the can, then we can actually show others and help scale it up because they'll see what actually is done in the process. Yeah, I feel fully heard, thanks. 
Uh, Sarah. Okay, one second, I've got my video on. Um, okay. Put time on. Yes, um, I like the idea because this is a transferable skill set. Um, once we could prove it to the political elites in one country, then there's no justification for them not utilizing it in another country. So you're saying the universal applicability of the empathy skill set. Yeah, because once uh, they realize that it's not a tool to be used against them, as is their normal want in their combative styles that they've been trained in, um, once they can see how the, 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 the conversation goes around in a circle rather than scoring points of each other, people actually um, listen to each other and hear each other and cross-pollinate each other rather than stealing from each other, then hopefully they can then relax into the process. So I'm really hearing you share about politicians currently using a debate format where they... <laughs> score points of who has the most pros and cons and it goes around in a circle and empathy might be the remedy to heal that yeah no uh politicians it, it's it's batted backwards and forwards across a chamber um but the empathy goes around in a circle and this circular conversation ends up allowing everyone to cross pollinate mm -hmm. with each other um, rather than actually stay within their entrenched views mm -hmm. got it got it so the circle, the empathy circle would be enabling people to hear each other and cross pollinate. Yeah, and I think this cross pollination, this um, showing people how much they have in common rather than, oh, I am this and you are that. Hang on, we are all something that's more than this and that. Hmm. So you're sharing empathy goes beyond labels and entrenched viewpoints. Yeah, because from my uh, personal experience of the um, empathy circle process, um, you'll see a conversation over two hours start off very, very timidly, but then you'll see uh, it goes around in a spiral nature because people will feed off each other's ideas and because they're relaxed in the process, because they know that they can be fully heard and they can hear themselves being reflected so they can hear what people understand of what they've said, they can relax into the process. So you're sharing how empathy creates a container where people feel safe to share their viewpoints because they feel heard. Yes. And the, the, the being heard process, actually the reflective process allows them to understand what others have heard of what they've said, because we always think we explain things in a way that others can understand, mm -hmm. but that's not always the case. So empathy enables people to reflect back and then enables the listener to make sure, the, the speaker to make sure that they're heard and understood. Thank you, Sarah, I feel fully heard. Okay, um, I'm going to pick um, Eric. Yes. <laughs> okay, so um, I am familiar with political divides and I'm familiar with local officials and officials in all level, and they use different brands of dishonesty in order to achieve political ends. And I actually see that as being an inherent issue with the political process. Okay, so uh, are you saying that uh, the, did you actually notice, regardless of this polit political spectrum that people are, that they actually use dishonesty and I, uh, I get the impression that that creates pain, but also that you can see that this creates um, all kinds of problems uh, within politics. Yeah, I'm not 
very clear in my words, but that's my first attempt. <laughs> it's fine. I hear politicians say what people want to hear and not be authentic. Mm. I see a lot of things that are not said. So you, you really would like to see authenticity in, uh, in politicians more than you see now? So, so, I ha so I have to say for myself that I know work working with local uh, public officials in a city I will not name, that there was a lot of behind the scenes maneuvering um, by people of industry. So there was a lot of deception. And so there was a lot of in influence from, I guess, lobbyists. So things were not, I'm sorry, so things were not honest. And it, because things were not honest, um, it's not just about, that, that played into things. Mm -hmm. So you, you can see dynamics that happen within a, a, a local political um, group you're part of. There were all these kind of dynamics that were really not honest. and. What you saw uh, created, uh, I don't, I can't grasp it either. Something like um, you can see it doesn't work and you can see it's ha actually harmful for, for the whole dynamics, I guess. I'll try to make it really clear. Um, yeah. um, so, so a whole group of people hired a lawyer so they can safeguard their city. Instead, uh -huh. um, industry came in and basically told city officials, this is how you can get around environmental safety. This is how you can fudge with language. This is how um, you can, and they did. Mm -hmm. And so the needs of the people were thrown out. And it was all because things were not honest and upfront. Things were not transparent. And mm -hmm. so that is a big hot button for me. Okay. So you saw um, industry coming in and they were actually using uh, their language and their ways to kind of uh, put the system to their own benefit. They were not being honest anymore to the public and to each other in that way as well, I guess. There's a play, there's a way, hey, this is how we can use language and this is how they've already set it up before. This is how we can, they actually were not truthful. They actually said, no, this is not the law. Yeah. Yes, it was the law. They actually lied. Yeah. So they're really aware that they're lying in the moment and they're, they're taking it as a conscious strategy to, to do their work, to get what they want. Uh, and that so makes actually, you feel really worried. Yeah. Well, as a result, um, so the, the end result was um, cell towers were put up all over this particular city. Then it wasn't even actually illegal. Every type of illegal um thing that could happen happened and um this being you know there was not it was so and this is an example of when things are not forthright and honest and upfront and every so that's what i see as an issue with politics is not just the empathy but the fact there's a lack of transparency and there's a way of working around mm -hmm. and so it seems like you're describing your upset there, that it's, it has a lot of effect down the line as well. It's not just a direct effect, but also after it's got a really bad influence uh, on the region where you live. And um, it's also not a, um, yeah, it, it just, it, it, I can't grasp that part of it. Uh, something like the upset you feel, you can really see it clearly. So, and it's, it's not beneficial, it's not helpful, it's not uh, supportive of, of your community. Is that I, close I feel, to where you... I feel yeah. honesty means transparency is the bedrock mm -hmm. of, of empathy. That's my thought. Honesty is the bedrock of empathy because yeah. I've seen every which way where it's not present and how okay. it's harmed community. Yeah, so, so, you, so, so you really deeply wish for honesty and transparency to be there and really trust that that's a bedrock of empathy. And, would, yeah, that's what you're really looking for to, to bring that into the political system. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, sir. Um, yeah. 
I'll go for round two with Edwin if that's okay, or, or is it better it's if I It's better go? to choose people who haven't spoken yet. Okay. So, uh, Liz, so uh, or, I'll go with uh, Ellie. Did you talk Eli. already? Ellie. Eli, sorry. Yeah, not yet. So, Eli. Um, hmm. So, I'm, uh, so I notice I'm a bit, being a bit nervous about trying to set this up in the sense that for me, it seems like I want to grab the opportunity and I want to include people. And I hope we can find a way that it really works. And my mind is working on that right now, yeah. So you're nervous about trying to find a way to make this really all work for everybody. Yeah. And uh, on a, yeah, <laughs> it's a indirect honesty. <laughs> but, uh, what I noticed, for instance, um, a few things in, in the movie, for instance, I saw the t-shirts and for me, it was a very simple print. And I imagined automatically, yeah, if people see these kind of t-shirts, they will think, oh, this is not a, um, not a professional organization where I think it is. And I feel afraid that people might think Mm, that's maybe not a kind of organization I want to be part of. So you were watching the presentation and were thinking that the t-shirts didn't give the, the professional appearance that you would like to be associated with. Yeah, and it, for me it has to do with this aesthetics, but also a kind of style that really shows we know what we're doing because I think people often uh, create opinions in a split second and that makes them react to what you're doing in a positive way or they already decided I don't want to even go into contact with those people. So your concern is that people are going to see the style of the shirts and come to conclusions just very quickly and not give this a chance. Yeah and that's just an example and I like um I believe, so I'm looking, and, and maybe I also really want to say that what I've seen until now from what Edwin is doing, I really appreciate what he's doing, how he thinks. And I think on a content level, he goes quite deep and integrates quite a lot of insights. And that contrasts then to the, what the t-shirts look like for me, it's, it's, it's like a very different uh, level, let's say. Yeah. So you're seeing the t-shirts as very simple, but you see what Edwin is doing, you really appreciate how in depth it is and how he brings together a lot of skill and brings a lot of skill to it. And you yeah. see those as incongruent. Yeah. And it might be viewed by people in a very different ways. Some people will not ever stumble upon something like that, but something about how you come across to others. Uh, seems to be important as well, certainly because it's such a high level as well of, uh, they're just people, but they also think in a kind of way that they, they want something that they're, they, if, if they will engage with the empathy and, and really make it something important, they need to also bring it out and there needs to be kind of a sales point as well. It's, it's before the empathy, there's something like sales. And for me, that's, sounds maybe really um, marketing is used to be a really ugly word for me but I've understood that's actually also it marketing can also be used to clarify what your soul is speaking for instance or something really beautiful to share it in a way that you open up people for what you have to share right so so you're seeing that you know because these are we're trying to reach congress people they're going to expect things to be at a certain professional level and that before we can get them into the empathy, we need to market the idea to them in a way that is attractive to them. Yeah, right? and it's not, just, it's not just about their expectancy, it's also about a whole atmosphere you create between people. Uh, and I think once you give this a chance, then you might be able to sense the the value, but still there's some level that I like to there to be present. And it's the t-shirt is just one example. Like I can see it in different parts of 
of, of how our things are communicated and stuff. So, yeah. so, so you're just focused on on the um, the t-shirts as an example, but you're really looking at the whole image of the whole collective um, yeah. project. Yeah, and. I, I, when I say this and I put so much uh, emphasis on it, I worry that it might sound like a dis something discouraging, but it's actually the opposite for me. I really would like this to work. So, so you're feeling nervous about saying this because you really would like it to be accepted as constructive and yeah. a contribution. Yeah. That was the time, Tara, if you saw Dean held up the okay. sign very meekly there. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I like to put it right in front. <laughs> yes. Are you feeling fully heard? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so, Thank you. Uh, Liz, is it? We haven't heard from Liz yet, right? So, can you be yeah. our listener? I thought you. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was very concerned watching the presentation when I heard. Um, Representative Desaulnier used the word masochist and say, you know, when he was asked if he would do this and he would say, oh, I'm a masochist, of course I will. A and that really bothered me. I got very triggered by it that he's immediately assuming this is going to be a painful process. Yeah, I hear you saying that while watching the video of the representative, um, him referring to this process as it being a masochistic one and almost ultimately um, uh, kind of like showing a, a particular perspective that he has about this process that doesn't sound like it's in alignment with the way that you this process. Yeah, I, I kind of got the impression he was just being glib. He felt on the spot, maybe, and it was a defensive reaction. Um, but I also recognize that for a lot of Congress people, this would be a painful process until they're used to it, um, until they have experienced it. The idea of, of going into the situation could be very painful for them. And I think that's something that we need to consider in how we market the program. Mm. I, I hear you having compassion and putting yourself in his shoes in terms of um, giving him the benefit of the doubt that he wasn't trying to be offensive per se, or, or um, but that for somebody in his position, it really could be a challenging uh, process for him um, and in that way, uh, this project needs to take that into account um, when communicating about it or marketing it. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure I have anything else to say just now. Um, I, I did want to say responding to what Eric was saying, that I agree that we want to establish an overall aesthetic in how the project is presented to people and that we should have, you know, really think about our audience in figuring out what that aesthetic should be. I hear you saying that you are, um share some of Eric's thoughts around making sure that this, uh, the word credibility comes to me with this, that yeah. the, brand, the brand and the, um, the presentation of the material uh, reflects and communicates its credibility. Yeah, I, we, we talked last night about the word empathy itself being an obstacle for some people and uh, so I did spend some time just jotting down words. And as we talk, I keep jotting down words that we are saying that I think can be used in presenting the project. 
you're saying that you're actively um, taking notes on and actively thinking about and exploring how best to frame and what language, what language to use within this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Fully heard for the moment. Shoshana, would you be interested in being my partner? Awesome. All right. Hi. Uh, well, thank you all for holding me into the mix as <laughs> seamlessly as you did. Um, yeah, you know, what comes to mind to me right now is um, just how needed this type of work is, uh, bringing people together um, and inviting them into a practice of empathically listening to each other. And um, because what I see is that uh, really across the political spectrum, there's um, There's, there's almost like, uh, actually, I, I even want to just kind of take myself, take, take a step back real quickly. Maybe I'll just pause with that first. <laughs> that first year. Sure. Uh, <laughs> All right, Liz. Um, so I heard you say that um, you um, are thankful that you were invited into this process tonight. We're glad to have you. Oh, I can't say that. Okay. And, um, and that you see how important this process and practice is to, um, our culture right now, because as you look across the political spectrum, there is, and you wanted to pause at that point. Yeah. Um, what I see in our country right now is um, just a lot of pain that has different narratives to it. And I think that a practice like this, a community space like this, uh, can uh, potentially help shed light on that. Yeah, Liz, um, you see in our that our country is very um, polarized, and that people are suffering with a lot of pain, and that they have very different um, narratives, and that you think that this process can really help um, to kind of right or to repair this divide. I think it has the potential to show commonality um, in a um, in a part of our society that is is driven by um, non commonality or differences. And so, Liz, you see this practice as having the potential to um, to help um, show that although people have different narratives, that they also share commonalities that um, right now the society is very driven by those differences. Maybe this practice could help them to see that maybe they could move that being drivenness to what they have in common. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, I think politics is driven by uh, differences. It's the bread and butter of it. Um, and, you know, I, I think of the, the Indian myth of um, blind men coming across an elephant and one's at the trunk, another's at the at, at a foot, another's at a tail, and um, just that they're all they all have different information, you know. Um, and so, being able to expand our pool of knowledge about that information would be of benefit to these complex, intractable problems that we're facing, not only um, as individual countries but also as a world. Yeah, and so um, you're talking about there's this Indian myth about uh, people taking the trunk or the tail uh, of, of, an, of an animal and not understanding the information that's held at these opposing ends and that possibly this practice could help increase eat the tail and the trunk's knowledge base so they start to meet somewhere on neutral territory and and help to break down some of this, um, these different narratives. Is that right? 
Yeah, and I would just add that the complexity of our world and the complexity of the issues that we're facing uh, environmentally, socially, politically, economically, really requires all of that information to be online and for us to have mechanisms for both communicating that, but then also hearing it too. Okay, Liz, and so the, compl the, the complexity of our world and you're including social, political, environmental, I mean, don't, I'm not sure if you said racial or not, um, but you think that possibly um, learning to use um, this tool could help to, um, for people to better hear each other. And I actually think I need you to clarify beyond that point. I saw that my time's up. Is there? Um, yeah, you can just okay kind of going? wrap it up, you know, whatever yeah. closing doesn't have to be exact. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just the interconnected nature of social and in, social, which includes racial, social and environmental and economic and political issues that um, they're such, they're, they're complex, big topics. So the you know, and there's grains of truth in everyone's perspectives. So we can have, uh, we can increase our pool of knowledge by coming together in, in ways like this to practice hearing each other. Okay. So I'm hearing you say that if we practice hearing each other, maybe people from all these different narratives will hear the grain of truth in all these different views enough to increase their knowledge base and, and actually move a little bit and help to solve some of these very complex problems in our world. Do you Thank feel you. heard? Yeah, I feel heard. Thanks, Rosanna. You're welcome, Liz. Um, Edwin, would you like to um, listen to me? Yep, listening. Okay. Um, yeah, boy, I have so much on my mind um, listening to everyone. And um, I think I'll just start with, um, with uh, talking about branding or marketing that Eric brought up, which I had never even gave a thought to in terms of the empathy circle until he brought it up. And I'll mm -hmm. So you want to build on the branding or marketing. It's like a, it was a new idea, but it's something you want to follow up. Yeah. On. Um, so I, I'm, I've been only involved in empathy circle for maybe a month. And I've really come to see it as a precious commodity to mankind, to humanity. And uh, I have already shared it with a number um, of my spheres of influence. I have a different, a few other groups and everybody's really interested that I've spoken with. Uh, however, if we're speaking about taking it so high in the food chain um, quickly, I almost feel like we're gonna take, you know, um, that big shot and I, I don't want to blow it as you know I really want it to um, to be heard deeply and I'll pause yeah so uh, you really want people to, you you've been doing empathy circles that you really see the benefits of it people you've shared it with have seen the, the benefits of it or interest in it but there's this chance to bring it to a higher political level and you don't you want to be able to take to have that uh, take that ch that uh, opportunity to really you know share it and maybe some concerns about the, the the naming of it or I'm sorry I live in Brooklyn and this is like my life this noise um, yeah so I was imagining after the conversation that Eric um, had about talking thinking about how, what would it take for Empathy Circle to, to trend, whether that would be on Twitter, YouTube, whatever it is. And I was thinking about, I listen to a lot of podcasts. What if you could find a conservative podcaster and a, and a um, very liberal podcaster who'd be willing to engage in an Empathy Circle with a couple of neutral people, maybe from our, uh, from our group? And one of them would be willing to put it on their podcast. These guys have tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of listeners. So I was just thinking, I mean, I know this is very random. That's what I'm thinking about. Yeah, so you're thinking about uh, getting some conservative podcasters to take part in an empathy circle and they have a big audience and, you know. You'd... With a liberal. 
Oh, with, with a liberal, a conservative and a liberal, sort of the podcasters, people who have large audiences and how to get them to take part in, and because yeah. they have a large audience to get the word out. Yeah, I think that would be so interesting or maybe someone on NPR, I mean, I don't know, but um, anyways, I just really think that um, the empathy circle really can serve humanity well and if there, you know, it's not to bring glory to an organization by any means, but to really, I, I really believe Edwin, you have a heart to serve humanity. And yeah, so I just didn't realize it's become very serious in my heart and mind just since this conversation started. So I'm processing, you know, even as I'm speaking to you about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're sort of processing these ideas as, as you speak. So, and uh, you feel like I have a good heart and and it, this is a real benefit for, for humanity. You're seeing the, the benefit of it. And one of the things I really appreciate about it is that um, I travel in my spheres of influence, like some of them are very religious and some of them are completely not religious and they, they're both grabbing at this. And so I think this really does cross some of the um, audiences that Liz was bringing up, you know, that have these different narratives because it doesn't come with an agenda other than to speak what's alive for you and be heard. Yeah, so you're you move in a lot of different circles and it's resonating with a lot of circles, but there's no agenda besides the willingness to listen and hear each other. Yeah, so um, yeah, I, I'm just really processing and I, I don't really have much more to say about it right now, but I, just, I appreciate what everyone has said. Okay, so you're just processing the, the ideas and uh, gratitude and appreciation for what everyone's sharing here. So if we have time, you know, I'm just thinking if, <laughs> if we could get two respected uh, podcasters to be willing to participate, and it ever came to the attention of co any Congress people, I mean, I could imagine some of them knocking on doors. Because I know, um, who's that conservative? I was so, so surprised. Oh, I heard, um, I know that Ted Cruz, very conservative. I, I know that he and Michael Knowles have now joined together on a podcast, which is very strange. I was very surprised about that. So there just, definitely seems to be some congressmen are listening to podcasts. That's all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, by influencing the podcasters, that can influence the, the politicians. They see that as a route to get to the podcasters, to get them involved. To well, they might spread not the word. Work <laughs> yeah, it maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, but it's just an <laughs> idea to kind of build on. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think it's my time has to be up, right? Yeah. Like yeah, okay. Thank and you. Uh, thanks. Uh, so we'll go with another, we have another 25 minutes so maybe go for another 15 minutes or so and then have a, a closing does that sound good we'll do a couple more rounds of this um then i'll speak to eli okay, uh, you're probably to ready away. to go to sleep it's past your bedtime i know <laughs> they're in the uk um yeah, I, I there was a, I have a video of actually uh, bring we take this empathy tent we take it to these political left right battles that happen here in Berkeley and I have some videos of actually doing an empathy circle in the middle of a semi riot so with uh, you know 150 police officers pro and anti Trump folks and just sort of, I like wanted to show it at some point I'm gonna put that to the slideshow yeah. So you're thinking back on the other videos that you have, like doing empathy circles in the middle of a riot in Berkeley. Um, I think I was there for at least one of those. Um, and um, you just think that footage would be a good addition to your slideshow. Yeah. And uh, there has been some people on the right that took part. They were them, they were coming to Berkeley, and they took part in an empathy circle, and that had like five thousand views, you know, for the the empathy circle. So it's just building on what uh, Shoshana is uh, saying that if you get the, the you know certain people to take part, it does kind of help spread spread the word, and it got it out to like would say to a lot of conservatives too. So. Yeah, I just kind of 
screen. So you're seeing having having the conservative activists participating in this is also another route to getting visibility for the project. Yeah, but we have the Congress and we have Mark DeSalnier kind of in the bag, right? It's like, that's the first one. And that's what I think we need to build around to get that yeah. circled together and having the sample circle. And then, you know, hopefully it can kind of spread from there. So I don't want to get too far afield with too many projects. Uh, you know, it's like the scope, if you get too broad of a scope, it gets too diffuse. So I think it's really about, this should really be about the, the you know, getting Congress members, you know, your Congress members. If we have a sample uh, circle that we can say, yes, they've done it, well, you can do it too, kind of. Yeah, so at least that's my thinking at the present. So you're kind of drawing back from this idea of finding these other routes to visibility and you wanna really focus on let's get the Congress people into this and do it. And then we can use that to get other Congress people. Yeah, but if anybody has energy and ideas to go reach out, that's great. You know, that's, you know, I don't wanna put a damper on, on that. Uh, it, it's very time, each of these projects takes a lot of time and a lot of work, like just, it's it, it just the follow up, make the connections uh, is, it, the build trust is, is quite a quite a bit of work, yeah. Okay, so you're, you're saying you don't wanna discourage people, they have the energy to spread this out further, you don't wanna discourage that, but it, you recognize how much effort it takes logistically to put these things together and you just want to focus your energy on the main goal. Yeah. And I actually went to the Republican convention here in California, the state convention, and uh, went and talked to Republicans. And we, I went with somebody else and we set up a table that was like in a public area. And we put a little sign that said empathy circles. And we started uh, offering empathic listening. We had you know, Proud Boys and the whole, you know, bunch of different people, you know, Paul, the, the person that ran for governor of California, John Cox, he came by and I talked to him. So, uh, so that's sort of, you know, all this kind of, it takes a lot of outreach like that to, you know, kind of make these connections. And I've talked to Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, a couple of times, you know, about doing empathy circles and uh, yeah, so, you know, it, it takes a lot to kind of build these relationships and then kind of try to get to make it happen. Yeah. So I hear you recognizing how much effort goes into the relationship building aspect of this and doing things like you went to the Republican, the California Republican Convention and spoke with Republicans there and you've reached out and started a to establish a relationship with the governor. So, yeah, so that's my time, I feel heard. Okay. Oh, um, are you with us, Sarah? I don't know if Sarah's yes, I, with yes, us. Yes, I am, yes, I am. Would you, like, would you like to be a listener? Sure. Okay. Um, Yeah, one of my concerns about getting involved in this project is that I am over in the UK. I'm not there on the ground, and I see that as creating extra difficulty for me um, to establish those relationships. But I also recognize that we're doing everything online anyway, so who knows where I am? Who cares where I am? And I have time, so why not? go ahead and get involved and do this because I see it as important. Mm. You're sharing about being in another country and so that theoretically would be a logistical difficulty but because the shelter in place and everything is online maybe it, it won't be and it's time to get involved. Yeah. Um. You know, I, I've, I've been involved in the past when I was in California. I was very involved in a lot of things um, and I, I miss that. And I'm still learning the politics over here. <laughs> That's kind of a wild ride. <laughs> but um, 
you know, I, I still care so much about the politics in the U.S. because it's still considered my country in my mind. I'm really hearing care and nostalgia for the politics in the United States and identification with being an American and also the edge of being in a new country. Yeah. I wish I, I wish I had um, better relationships with my representatives. Um, I used to at one time, and I don't now. And I, I, you know, I'm trying to think, do I have any relationship at all with any of the Republican elected officials? <laughs> it's like, I don't think I do. Um, so, yeah, I think getting the Republicans to participate is going to be more difficult than getting the Democrats to participate. And so I'll probably focus my energy on trying to establish some connections with some Republicans and get them involved. Hmm. So you're reflecting back on, will Republican politicians even be open? And where the best put your energy? And I think that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Shall we do one more? If you want to just speak, Sarah, and then we'll sort of have a deep final debrief for okay. 10 minutes. Okay, I'll pick Liz. Hey, Sarah. Hi. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, I think this is a topic that there is a lot of complexities in the narratives in the United States. I think there's a lot of um, identity politics where people, um, I'm actually not, uh, Liz, I'm not seeing you on the screen. So can you see me now? I can see you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah. I, I think there's a lot of identity politics where people, that's their identity, not about the issue people get very self-righteous about that and yeah yeah I, I hear you um reflecting back some of the complexity that you heard me share earlier and then bringing up the topic of identity and identity politics specifically and how that um the words that are coming to me right now is just how that's such a source of division within politics. It's, it's been, I've also heard from others about the importance of having dialogue. And I think Marion Williamson had a dialogue recently with um, some Republican, um, she was running. So I think there was, there was a conversation and I listened to it, but I didn't hear anything truly healing I, I just there was something missing um i'll add because in on my um one of my, my cousin's facebook feed there's a back and forth continually and people are labeling each other and i actually got pretty um i actually called someone said why are you labeling people liberals why have you even like they actually pointed out a person and when someone expressed their opinion and I go, well, liberals think that way. And that person was, was actually an independent party, but they were labeled. And it becomes this liberal versus conservative labeling. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. For, I hear you just saying, um, just seeing in action how that labeling, how putting people into categories, into groups, and um, um, 
is really just the the both the the like um the harmful nature of that but then also like how um unconstructive that is also and you sharing a personal story about actually reaching out and um stepping in and uh taking a stand around that yeah that's more it's it's like that basically in a nutshell the conversations like I don't see anything fraudulent with this election. And the other persons are like, there's plenty of ways it's fraudulent. I'm really sad and sorry you don't see the truth. And the other person says back, I feel the same way about you. Yeah, just you, like you being, you seeing so clearly how that mechanism shuts down, shuts down the conversation and it's, the same mechanism too in terms of closing each other out shutting out and being so like uh, yeah self-righteous you know so so self-righteous in in the belief and in the standpoint that um there's no willingness or ability to hear the other or even engage with the other there is no willingness to hear or engage the other it just doesn't matter how one side what they do is they cite <coughs> references um, from media sources that come from different sides. And I got, I personally got frustrated because they were citing, I just, uh, one person cited a source, I go, yeah, you're citing the source, but this person has a bias. They have, you know, th that's what I said. I said, they, and I, and I said, I've done a history on not just the newspaper, but the reporter and the history of that reporter and the track record of that reporter. And that, and so then the comment back was, well, that's how liberals think, you know, mm -hmm. and so it was, it was, yeah. I was very frustrated about media bias. I'm frustrated about, about journalistic integrity, influencing people's um, polarization. Yeah, just your frustration with um, information sources, news search sources, journalism, and uh, you sharing, you actually walking somebody through the process of doing due diligence around um, really looking for where information's coming from, where the news source is coming from, and then feeling that shut down just through that same mechanisms that we were talking about earlier in terms of mm -hmm. um, just calling someone a liberal or... And I was even, um, somebody left a little message when somebody booted somebody else out of, of, of a group on Facebook because they had a different political opinion both have the same and then I said we're all on the same page regarding this environmental cause why are you kicking out this you know well, oh, shouldn't we be all standing in solidarity together and I got a little little voice message uh, on my messenger saying you are so naive blah 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 why because I'm asking people to stand together in solidarity that makes me um now labeled as foolish naive my time is up do I respond more more time or do we yeah just a final there? reflection oh. and then uh, just end yeah. the reflection yeah just the the further frustration um and pain and disappointment and um feeling people not seeing um how much they're limiting um the ability to come together around shared causes and uh, allowing um these these differences and perceived differences to um, um, affect our ability to work together on the issues that we care about. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. That's yeah. Thank you so much. So uh, just in the last uh, 10 minutes, I want to just see about the uh, next steps to do. Uh, what I'm thinking is uh, we can meet every Saturday, you know, for for, for a while. Uh, I was thinking of meeting a bit earlier at uh, 11 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, I mean, it'd be easier for the UK uh, folks in, in Europe. Uh, so if that, that works, um, it'd be 11 a.m. Pacific time, which I can't, I don't know what that is in the UK or 
7 for 7 European. PM. 7 p.m. So that might be a more convenient time. Yeah. I think it'd be more convenient uh, for me too. Uh, so the sort of the outline I'm imagining is I would give a pre that presentation. I want to keep refining it and kind of help to onboard people. It's like, you know, kind of build a team. And I keep refining that. And then we have an empathy circle. And then maybe we come up with a bit of a list, a to do list. Uh, the main thing I think is for everyone to get really comfortable with the empathy circle process. So we're actually doing that here. We're, you know, kind of learning it, getting grounded in it. And I think it's good for team building. And then there's also, we have the uh, facilitation training. If, if uh, anyone can take, is interested in that training, this training, we have the next cohort seven is coming up, starts next week. It's geared for Australia, US time. So if you, it wouldn't work very well for the UK. And uh, then probably in January, we'll be doing another training, uh, set up some trainings for US uh, Europe time that's, that fits there. So I think it's good if everybody on the team is, is able to take the training so that you not only can take part in an empathy circle, but know how to facilitate it, because that's really the core of what we're doing is we're trying to get Congress members to, to just to facilitate the simple, you know, being able to talk to each other empathically. I think Shoshana, you really laid it out. It's like, there's no agenda besides getting people to talk to each other. There's no, there's no policy, there's no strategy. It's like, you know, whatever you're, it, it's just the actual, you know, empathic dialogue that we're kind of promoting here. So I also, there's a link I put to our, to, uh, so the notes, uh, you can, I've been making some notes in this document. Are you able to access it? Is that shared? I just put that link in there. It's a Google doc. Oh yeah, other people are there. So I put all of your names in there so you can add your email, you know, contact info. Uh, I got a list there of the congressional representatives to contact. So that's Mark DeSalonier who I've talked to. He had done a call with Jamie Raskin from Maryland. So I know that he knows him and then Barb Lee. So those are, you know, start building a list of uh, representatives that we can start reaching out to uh, and uh, then get a list of, uh, you know, team members or emails. I made a few notes there in, in the following pages. You know, there's, uh, if you scroll down farther, you'll see notes from the first meeting we had yesterday too. And we'll just kind of use this document to keep building. So maybe we could just go around uh, any kind of ideas, next steps that you want to do. And uh, you, know, you can jot them down there. So. Eli, if you, what, do you have any thoughts what you're wanting to do? Oh, my next step is sleep. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yay. <laughs> oh, but then I was thinking, you know, I, I, I should at least make a list of the Republican Congress people from California and start figuring out how it would be best to get in touch with them and start the process. Yeah, great. Uh, that, be happy uh, to do that. As we start dialoguing, you know, you can start working on it and then come back and report, you know, in the empathy circle. And there's something called the uh, Problem Solvers Caucus that I came across. So it's an equal number of Republicans and Democrats who say that they're going to try to work together. So if you look that up, so those are, we can kind of find candidates who are, I mean, uh, representatives who already have, you know, are actually advocating for, you know, across party dialogue. So you can certainly build on that. That'd be great. And can you make these calls like ongoing? Is that work for, mm -hmm. for Saturdays? Okay, great. Yeah. So uh, Shoshana, you're muted. I was just thinking I'm going to do what, what Eli said. I think I'm going to try to find out. I don't even know who my Republican congressmen are here and I'll try to find out. I, I can find out who they are. And I guess I'll just start reaching out to their offices. I'm sure it'll take a long time to talk to anyone, but we'll see. Okay. Yeah. Usually your own Congress member for your own district 
is they'll be pretty receptive. They'll, you know, they, it's surprise. I was kind of surprised at how receptive they were. It's like if they're outside of your district, that starts getting a bit challenging. Yeah. yeah I'll start in my district. Yeah. So thanks, uh, Eric. Uh, I think my next step is putting the next meeting in my calendar. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, that's a big step. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then being and then just being present actually because um, for me it feels already I, for me it works better that way. I, it's hard to explain, but it's something about building it from within rather than without, and then gradually understanding how things can move forward and. Um, getting a sense of everyone who's on board and and how, how it is to work together. I think for the moment, that's that's what I'm doing. I think I can contribute the best. Yeah, we need to get way. kind of familiar with each other, get to know each other. And, uh, you know, if you want to work on some kind of uh, branding type stuff or whatever, you know, whatever, whatever yeah. is alive for you. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, that will grow gradually, but I, 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 it, I don't put a literal next step on that one because i just wanted to simmer a bit mm -hmm. before i act on it yeah. okay and can you come next week or yeah yeah i will put it in my calendar okay, right cool. after yeah. yeah and there's also promotion bring other people on board too. kind of reach out so yeah i was thinking of um people from internal family systems that's a very big community group as well and there it's a very different method but it's also empathic so i'd like to invite people from that place yeah yeah, great. So, yeah, thanks, uh, Liz. Yeah, I just want to thank you guys again for you all again for welcoming me in and, and sharing this this model with me. Um, my next steps will be to follow up on some of the links that you sent and further read and explore what you all are doing. Um, and it seems like is the newsletter is a good way to stay in touch and hear updates. Uh, did you receive my newsletter? Do you mean, did you? Get I that? did. Yeah, that's oh, how okay. I found yeah, out about I, this. I, I put all this. Yeah, I put kind of the latest out there. Yeah. And also okay. there's the actually this, this, are you on Facebook? Because uh, this yeah. Facebook event, this is the main Facebook event uh, for this project. So great. And it's, I don't know, it seems to be growing fast. I looked at it a little while ago and there was 90 people. There's now 102 interested. So I don't know what that means. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Yeah, it's really great. I don't, I don't know what I could commit to this, so, mm -hmm. but I really appreciate, you know, learning about it and um, I'll definitely keep it in mind. Okay, cool. And the uh, video will be online too for the first part that you missed. Yeah, Eric? Great. Uh, I just noticed that the 28th is next date, not next week. So I wonder if that's not added to the If dates. you just refresh, I just added it while we were talking. Ah, okay. I added that's it fine. <laughs> yeah. You just hit the refresh, it should be there. That's fine. Yeah, things happen. <laughs> okay, Dean? Well, not being an American citizen, I I'm here to learn from uh, the brothers across the pond how I can implement this in first of all in my local constituencies um, and then um, hopefully we can get it modeled over there take it over here so um, if, if I can give an out, outsider's point of view occasionally just chuck my tuppence in um, if you're quite happy with me to do that I'm absolutely uh, quite happy to contribute. Yeah. yeah cool I would so the uh, Dean comes from the Extinction Rebellion groups. So that's how, how we got connected. And uh, the our empathy group has done a lot with the Extinction Rebellion. So it's really the empathy circles kind of spread throughout uh, Extinction Rebellion. And it was actually from Norway. Uh, one of the people who was doing empathy circles there. He said, you know, we need to set up in front of the Norwegian Parliament and also demand that they do empathy circles. So. Uh, I'm very, you know, I really appreciate like Extinction Rebellion, the social activism, you know, getting on the streets, setting up those empathy tents in front of parliament or Congress or the White House. So COVID's put a bit of a damper, you know, on that initiative. But I, right now we're kind of focusing on doing it online and uh, with the training. So hopefully everyone can take part. And Dean's also doing train the trainer for the facilitation training. So. 
So yeah, cool. So Sarah, my right, final. Um, okay, I'll turn my video back on. Yeah, this is this is pretty interesting. I'm just kind of absorbing what everybody shared. Okay. And, okay. Reach out to Barbara Lee, say you're in her district, right? So it's like, Barbara, you said you do an empathy circle, you know. Not my district. You're not? I thought you're in Alameda. Where are you at? I'm in Alameda County. Eric Swalwell is mine. Oh, okay. Well, oh, that's another person to check with. Yeah. So, okay. Well, cool. Well, that's it for today. We'll be, we'll do the same thing again uh, next week and, you know, just keep iterating on, on this project. And I'm pretty excited about it. Empathy goes to Congress. <laughs> so see you next I week. Like <laughs> right. Take care. Thank you all. Until next time. Yeah. See, see you, you next time. All right. All right.